Hello, I'm Richard. And I'm not Judy. And this is the show that everyone's calling to Rotherham Show. Well, they're not. They are, they're just they are. They're just they're not. Not. <laughs> And I'm called Richard Herring, and welcome to the show that absolutely everyone is calling to Wumranger. Yeah, well, they're not, are they? They so are, they not, just did it, Stu. You, you made them. them do it. I um, didn't. They said be, it was before, spontaneous. Before we start, we had a, a rather serious complaint oh, yeah. uh, about last week's show from the Broadcasting Standards Commission, and the BBC lawyers have told us that we're legally obliged to read out this letter that we received last week. Dear BBC, I am writing to protest in the strongest possible terms about the sketch last week in which I, Anthony Hopkins, a respected Oscar-winning actor, was implied to be harbouring repressed sexual desires for my co-starring actresses, desires which eventually vented themselves in a most disturbing and perverted way. I deny this completely, and as my good name has been sullied, unless an immediate apology is forthcoming, I shall be forced to seek legal advice. Yours sincerely, Anthony Hopkins. P.S. I am winking as I write. <laughs> Winking, Stuart. Andy Hopkins is winking hey. as he writes that. It's got a sense of fun behind it. Certainly has. Um, will you please welcome on the keyboards Richard Thomas. Hey. Musician and actor Richard is 33 years old and lives in rented accommodation near London's fashionable Elephant and Castle. I'll lay off, Stuart. Well, you do. <laughs> on the listings couch, husband and wife information team Joe Unwin and the actor Kevin Eldon. <laughs> And don't go forgetting our gorgeous new bar slaves, Trevor and Natalie. Trevor and Natalie. Yay! Easy on the eye. They're easy on the eye, here so they come. It's easy on. on the eye. Now, if you've been watching uh, in previous weeks, you'll know that like the Parliamentary oh. Labour Party... Oh, excuse me, mate, I'm trying to talk well, here. Excuse me, mate, I'm trying to talk here. I'm Stuart. Richard, who is this? It's, it's Nikolai, it's my French exchange partner. Well, what is he doing here? <laughs> no. It's his turn to come over to Britain. Well, you're still doing exchanges now. Yeah. 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 I don't really opinions. like him very much. You know, he, yeah. he smells a bit unusual and, uh, you know, he bullies me all the time. But, you know, he's, my mum says Richard, he has to come on. You're 30 years old. Oh. You have to do exchanges, do you? Come on, Rich, let's go. We said we'd go to the truck at Oh, yeah? Go on, rock circus and sing a well. Come on. No, look, we just have to do this. It's 45 minutes, okay? Just sit nicely so and wait. Boring. Just, just, no. just keep them quiet, all right? Yeah, just keep them quiet. Don't mock me like that. Shut up, I've just got to do this. Just Shut up. Bit. Right, now, like the Parliamentary Labour Party. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> we have five aims which we hope to fulfil by the end of the series. Yeah, let's recap and see how we're getting on so far. Aim one is to prove that the mystery father of Jodie Foster's baby is in fact Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> and that she is the only one of his co-stars to have succumbed to his depraved advances. Boring. Apart from the grizzly bear in the edge. And uh, <laughs> aim two is to attempt to make the royal family more popular by stripping them not only of their titles, but also of their clothes. And then sending them off on a full Monty-style tour of northern working men's clubs. <laughs> Boring. Aim three is to replace Saddam Hussein's moustache with a slug that has been trained to burrow into his face while he's asleep <laughs> and eat the parts of his brain that make him evil. Boring. Aim Boring. four is to have the KFC nibbling it girls, Tara Palmer, Tompkinson and Tamara Beckwith, deep fried in hot oil, battered in Colonel Sanders' secret recipe and then fed to a pack of ravenous dogs. Holy! Finger licking good, apparently so. Yeah. And aim five, finally, to capture a Bigfoot live and then force it to live with a cutesy American family to see if it would really have lovable sitcom-style adventures or whether it would just rip off the children's heads and drink their blood. <laughs> oh, that's, boring! That's, that's all the aims for this week. Judge us on our ability to fulfil them. Don't do that! It's so Stop boring. it! So unprofessional. I'm sorry, you? those are illegal. <laughs> Oh, 
let us eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. Literally. <laughs> Over to Joe Unwin and the actor Kevin Eldon for this week's phone in. Oh, boy! Hey, 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 hey. Stinking frog. Now, this, <laughs> this week's phone in explores the possibilities of cloning and gen genetic engineering and asks you to decide is humanity really responsible enough to play God? Yes. What kind of choices would you make if the genes of famous people and various animals were left in your hands? So, dial 0891 338801 if you would genetically engineer a hybrid of They Think It's All Over contestant Lee Hurst and a llama. 0891 Dial 0891-338802 if you'd create a monstrous union of Challenge TV's Pat Sharp, <laughs> a lizard's body and the eye of a fly. 0891-338802. And dial 0891-338803 if you'd fashion a mutant out of the body of Natalie Imbruglia and the head of an ant. 0891-338803. In the name of reason, dial now. And we should point out there that in all those instances, neither the animal parts nor the human body parts have been proportionally increased or decreased in size to match each other. Thus, you'll have seen there, Pat Sharp's head, for example, uh, would be far too big for his body, his lizard body, and would drag painfully along the ground. And also, Pat wouldn't be able to focus his two very different eyes on any object at all. I don't know whether that will influence your choice yeah, in any way. Presumably under those circumstances, Pat Sharp's TV presenting career would almost certainly be over. Not on Challenge TV, no. No, no that's they're not. not. <laughs> I've been looking at the papers, I still can't get over the fact that, you know, old punk rocker Tommy Lee yeah, yeah. wasn't happy being married to Pamela Anderson. Know, What's going yeah. on? Well, he's a classic example, old punk rocker Tommy Lee, yes. of an example of successful men falling into what I call the I could do better syndrome, What's right? That, well, Tommy Lee's looked at Pamela Anderson, he's yeah. thought, oh, Baywatch babe, yeah. you know, world-class pin-up. Yeah. Still, I could do better than that. Yeah. Know? It's a bit like uh, Prince Charles in the yeah. 1980s. I don't know if you remember, he was going out with Lady Di oh, yeah, back yeah, then. Remember, yeah. uh, probably the most beautiful woman in the world. Yeah. He looked at her and he thought, well, oh, she's not bad. Well, I could do better than That's that. That's right. Yeah. So Prince Charles left her and he started going out with a woman who looks like Iggy Pop's ass. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Jerry Hall actually had some good advice on how to stop your man from straying. Which, uh, which certainly worked with Mick Jagger, didn't it? So uh, she said, uh, if you want to keep your man, you should act like a cook in the kitchen, a maid in the parlour, and a whore in the bedroom. Good advice, although uh, better advice is most men are probably happier if you just act like a whore in every room of the house. That'll yeah. be fine. <laughs> if you can't cook, just send out for a pizza while you're whoring in the airing cupboard. <laughs> or if you're a particularly good cook, just send out for a whore. Uh, down here in London, they're about the same price. Yeah. You don't get anchovies, do you, though, no. Not on the pizza, anyway. Oh, that's <laughs> not what I meant. Let's it's take a look monkey. at what's coming up later in the show. <laughs> At 12.25, we'll be tasting wines from around the world in a thinly veiled attempt to get drunk at the licence player's expense. <laughs> and at 12.32, we'll be asking, are magic marker pens really magic? Or does it just feel that way if you spend enough time in the multi-storey car park sniffing them? <laughs> Don't do that, of course. At 12.40, we'll be talking to the lads who beat up Tony Blair's son and giving them the address of the sprout-faced little boy who does the video guru reviews on Live and Kicking. And um, Rich did mean to say the video guru reviews. I did, I meant to say that. You were wondering. He makes me so angry, what? Adam I Stu. Can't even speak. I can't speak. And at 12.30, we'll be asking <laughs> Oasis Wildman Liam Gallagher how it feels to be considered a thuggish, uncouth yob, even by Australians. Yeah. <laughs> right, now, um, last week we asked you to send in your ideas as to what might be in the Millennium Dome as a way of honouring the historic occasion that that yeah, is. Yeah, your uh, Millennium Dome diagrams varied wildly in quality from this detailed and complex image, courtesy of Helen Lee of Wimbledon, which uses colour and glitter to startling effect, to this hurriedly executed doodle from Natalia B of Wimbledon, which is so simple it seems contemptuous of all representational art and yeah. is rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> Our favourite one, though, was this one, where there's a, I don't know if you can see that, there's a large inflatable vagrant representing the spirit of freedom gone wrong. Yep. Yeah. And an exhibit there in which the twin worlds of politics and fairs are combined in the Enoch Powell ball in mouth game. Yeah. <laughs> and it's artist Jason Richardson who is 36 years old but still thought this was worth sending in, is this week's King of the Show. <laughs> King Jason, I was, I was wondering, how did you come up with this fantastical vision? What? 
Well, I actually can't remember because I came up with it in my sleep. So in your sleep. A bit like uh, Coleridge or some kind of visionary like that. That's yeah. right. I've lost everyone. Martin Luther King, I had a dream. This one probably will fail to inspire the civil rights movement in quite the same way, though. <laughs> Never mind. Now, King Jason, <coughs> we didn't bring you all the way from Wallasey in Liverpool to London to just be sat next to you by a man whose face is clearly too small for his head. Oh, Shut no. up, you leave him alone. I love you, Trevor, you're looking great. You'll also get to eat and drink whatever you desire from this, the All Europe Confectionery Trolley. <laughs> and this week's trolley is lavish with the finest sweetmeats Europe has to offer, as advertised in poorly dubbed, conspicuously foreign adverts. Yeah, from Germany, we've got my favourite, Kinder Eggs. It's kinder Eggs, Richard. No, my dad calls them Kinder Eggs, and oh, he should okay, know. Right. They're called that because they're a kind of egg. That's yeah. <laughs> kinder Eggs. Oh, Mum, I won some chocolate, a surprise, and small parts which may prove hazardous to younger children. <laughs> from Spain, where there's originals. Uh, do you remember your first Werther's original, Stu? Yeah, because it had been spiked with LSD. Hmm. <laughs> Responsible. And from Switzerland, the Alpine horn player's medicine of choice. Ricola! And as ever, from America, a very telling satire of that advert there, Golden Grahams! Yeah, of course, strictly speaking, America isn't a part of Europe, although most of the people that live there have so little idea of geography that it may as well be. Yeah. <laughs> Graham's there, I notice, are still bearing the advertising slogan, Can you handle the taste? Can you handle the taste, Stu? No, because taste is a metaphysical concept and thus cannot be handled. <laughs> Boy, got Nestle on philosophical grounds alone. And uh, let's see if our king, for all his royal might, can handle the taste of Golden Graham's. Eat the, Eat the Graham's. Eat the Golden Eat Graham's. Graham's. Eat the Graham's. Eat into them. his kingly mouth. Eat oh. Can you, can you handle the taste? No, they're foul. They're foul. Oh, the, king. the king has spoken. Hey. Well, they live in your body and they're lots of fun, but they all need each other, one for all and all for one. They come out your belly button when you're asleep and over to organ and they sneakily creep. At Lily Liver, Henry Hart, Barry Bladder and Beryl Brain. Yes, it's time to meet the organ gang again. Who's in Mr. Cosgrave's pedal bin today? Why, it's Lily Liver. Hello, Lily. <laughs> Lily Liver lives in Hepatic Artery Avenue, just round the corner from Lionel and Lenny Lund, and right next door to Jean Paul Gallstone's bouncy bladder castle. Please, Lily, for me, no. It's clever beryl brain and that cheeky liquid waste storage organ, Barry Bladder. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just off to the toilet. Lily is refusing to eat. She says she's fat. I'm not eating anything ever again. So I am trying my darndest to cook her something so delicious that she will have to eat it. Do you all want to help? And the organs worked furiously to prepare a dish that Lily would eat. They baked and they fried and they whisked and they chopped, apart from Barry Bladder, who just drank any available liquid. <coughs> I'm just off to the toilet. But every time a dish was ready, the preparations stopped as they took the food to Lily. No! They baked and they fried and they whisked and they chopped, apart from Barry Bladder, who had found some vinegar in a cupboard. I'm just off to the toilet. Until the next dish was ready. No, I don't want it. I calculate that if Lily doesn't eat something soon, she will die in 32 minutes. And when Lily Liver dies, all her friends die too. Will our pals convince Lily to eat something for the good of everyone? Or will they let her die? Hence the title, Liver Let Die, you see. <laughs> Find out in a few minutes' time. The, uh, the organ gang. Do you like the organ gang, King Jason? Not really, no. no. It's a bit weak, I think. It's a bit weak. There we go. See, it's live, straight from the horse's mouth. <laughs> he's, he's a real person. With yeah, a real opinion. Real opinion. Um, who would you like to serve your birthday, uh, Trevor or Natalie? Uh, it's got to be Trevor. Trevor? Yeah. Trevor, right, actually, so, uh, Trevor. Well, even despite his small face. Yes. Right. Well, I'm glad I've seen you there, Trevor, actually, because uh, we got this letter um, about you this week. It says, um, it's from a Louis Duval of uh, SE14 in London. 
He says, I was watching the TV on Sunday and felt alarmed at the way you treated the young boy. That's you, Trev. See? I cannot understand why you choose to employ him if you're only going to abuse him in a weak attempt to make yourself look superior. Allow the boy a chance to reply to his tormentor. And then at the end he's put, you're right though, he does have a small face. <laughs> See that? Yeah. 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 This is so oh, Nicola, boring! Nicola. Let's go down to HMV, right, and run around and steal the CDs of David Hasselhoff. No, no, no just wait yeah. a minute, just stop. Just what are you doing? You, you can't smoke, you can't do that on telly. Yes, I can, it is my hobby, I like to smoke. Mm. Don't do that. My other hobby is making my tight cycle shots, even oh tighter, God, and no. dancing around, eh? Stop you it. like Mr. Come King? On, no. Come on, on Nicola, Nicola, let's go party! Yeah. Yeah. Monarchy. I don't want a cigarette. What if my mum's watching? But you had one on the ferry. Go, Nicola. Oh, this is so away. boring. Go. Oh, horrible. I like Get this. Out. Get out oh, of this. This is great. Just uh, go away. I call you Dr. Jones. Dr. Get Dr. out of Jones. Dr. <laughs> Who are you? Go away. What a, what a rewarding cultural exchange that has been. <laughs> like all mothers, Mother Nature is a whore who will entertain the most obviously unsuitable stranger from off the street, bringing them into your home and saying they're your uncle, leaving you confused without any real father figure to rely on. Hi, I'm Greg Evigan, and this is When Insects Attack. This week, a spider. Yeah, well, I just come back from playing football in the park, you know, Sunday morning, and I felt sticky. So uh, I decided to wash myself in the shower, in the water. And, um... That was when it happened. Remember, all the footage you are seeing here is genuine amateur camcorder videotape, as usual. I remember I went in the bathroom and I pulled back the curtain from around the bath and I looked in there and there was a bloody great spider looking up at me, pleased as jam. And I just jumped back. And I wasn't frightened of it, I was just surprised to see it. You know, I bumped my arm. Now, I don't like spiders, but I respect their tenacity, so I scooped him up. And little fella, you know, and I took him out, just chucked him away in the street like that. My arm uh, hurt afterwards, though, for a bit. <laughs> well... Ian will be thinking twice before he tries to wash himself after a sporter again, however sticky he feels. Now, before you snatch up your pens, I know that technically speaking a spider isn't an insect, but an arachnid. But I think broadly speaking they're the same thing, okay? <coughs> Ian Crochard's aching arm is a constant reminder to him of what can happen when insects or arachnids attack. If you have any home video footage of people being attacked by insects, please send it in. It would be good if the things attacking people in the videos were strictly speaking insects. I, I mean, just because we've had a spider on the show, don't start thinking you can send in footage of, of dogs or otters or, or, or giraffes. I'm Greg Evigan. Goodbye. I'm, I made this. <laughs> There, of also appeared in Tech Wars. Many people have reminded us. Uh, this was another top submission from our Millennium Dome competition. Daniel Stirrup of New Cross sent this in, which is model on the head of fat singer Buster Blood Vessel. That's there. right. And uh, like Ayers Rock, most of Blood Vessel's head is beneath the sand. Only the bold dome area actually houses any exhibits. There you are. Yeah, it's very exciting. Loads yes. of entries we've got. Are you looking forward to the Millennium Stu? Yeah, I'm really looking forward, Rich, to celebrating the 2000th anniversary of nothing. Right? Because if Jesus existed, which he obviously didn't, right, then he must have been born in at least 6 BC while King Harry was still on the throne. So, yes, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, so am I. Should so be a good party, listen, shouldn't it? All no, the girls no, will probably be drunk. I reckon you definitely get a snog no, then. Uh, look, look, like, <laughs> the 2000 only appears significant because we have you know, work in base 10 because we've got 10 fingers, yeah. right? If we'd all got nine and a half fingers, like Dave Allen, right, then we'd have <laughs> decades of nine and a half years, centuries of nine and a half decades, a millennium of nine and a half centuries, right? So on the Dave Allen planet, the Dave Allen people will be celebrating the dawn of the third Dave Allen millennium at lunchtime on October the 1st, 1714, right? So therefore, the millennium is stupid. It's very interesting, Stu. 
We don't live on that planet, they do. It's we live on the planet Earth, don't we? I'm glad we do. I respect their traditions and everything, exist. but I'm glad we, met, we live here. Because, you know, it's the year 2000. I've missed 1714. Just, just because a number's got loads of zeros in it doesn't make it significant. doesn't mean anything. Of course anything. it does. doesn't. What are you seriously yeah. trying to say, then? Yeah. That when you're in your car with your mum and dad, right, yeah. and the mileometer's just coming up to 50,000 miles, right, right, and your dad makes everyone stop and watch the mileometer and everyone goes, Ooh! Yeah. That, that means nothing. Yeah, it doesn't mean anything. It's just. The... So why does everyone go woo? Oh, if it means know. nothing. Do you mean... agree that they go woo? Yeah, people do that. Well, that's a noise reserved for special occasions. Yeah, woo! That is. It mean people have been going woo in cars like that for millions of years. Well, they haven't, haven't and suddenly you come along, you think you know better than everyone in I'm human history. Saying... You make me sick, sick to the stomach. All right. To all right. see the face of a child or a woman light up when it sees a number followed by a string of zeros it's one of the most moving things on god's earth your heart is dead the millennium dead. it's nonsense and there's an end on god, it That's you're it. a damp squib you asked you i'm not having you around to my millennium party so i'll just be you on your own then rich <laughs> yeah all right you can come then right bring a bottle though a bottle of what of milk obviously what, milk? Hello, milk. milk milk from the future like the future genetically milk. engineered what mammal. lee hurst llama milk yeah that'd be right, quite okay. interesting <laughs> Be interesting to say. Yeah, I'd be like you resistant to being farmed, though. Time to go over to Joe Unwin and the actor Kevin Eldon for the listings. <laughs> Thank you very much. And remember, if your relationship is floundering, perhaps like uh, Tommy Lee and Pamela Anderson, maybe all you need is a bit of a day out at one of our recommended events to cheer yourselves up. And that's something weird now about, is it? Just do your little bit. <laughs> First, this week, a dog running around. A dog will be running around in a park or a piece of wasteland near where you live at some point over the next few days, I expect. So why not go and look at the dog and try to imagine what it might be thinking about? Food, probably, or other dogs, or maybe an unusual smell that it has smelt. This free event runs continuously and is open to everyone. Oh, lordy. And what about this? Yeah, my face. My face will be on the front of my head all the time, forever, from now on, and ever shall be. If you would like to look at my face, then find me, and then look at my face. Or video my face speaking now, and then you can look at my face as much as you want, whenever you want, however you want. So that's my face, the front of my head, all the time, forever. You disgust me. Yeah, maybe that's why you stick around. And now, <laughs> it's time for an update on your calls. We've had 301 calls so far. 27% um, of you would like to see Lee Hurst's head on a llama. 31% favour the Pat Sharp lizard's body flies eye option. And 42% are behind the Natalia Brulia <laughs> ant's head's choice. Mm, that's coming along nicely. Hey guys, uh, I was just thinking, I'll tell you whose head I'd like to see attached to a llama. Would it be Tony Blair? Yes, yes it would. <laughs> Uh, remember there also, that is uh, a normal sized ant's head on top of uh, Natalie and Brulia's body. Uh, in fact, it's doubtful whether Natalie would be able to get enough air into her human sized lungs through the, the tiny ant's throat, uh, resulting in all sorts of respiratory problems. Yeah. Still, though, it's amazing what scientists can do these days. Yeah, isn't up to it? your it's point. It's amazing yeah. thing um, to be able to but, make but that. Something, something like the, the ant headed Natalie and Brulia, right? That, that raises more questions than it answers, doesn't it? Doesn't no, it does. I mean, if you had a thing, right, with Natalie and Brulia's body and an ant's head, does it think and reason like an ant, right? Or does it think and reason like an ex-Australian soap star who wants to be Alanis Morissette? What well, think? Stu, it, it thinks and reasons like an, an ant, yeah. obviously. Well, it's so obvious. Even a well, lamb would know that, Don't patronise me, don't It's you? obvious, no, which well, is a good why? thing, actually. Because if you saw the Natalie and Bruglia ant head thing coming down the street, yeah. you could just run out quickly, lay a trail of sugar out, and lure it into your house. Well, well, For who which, knows what kind of malarkey you're up to. What are you saying? <laughs> an ant-headed Natalie and Bruglia doesn't bear thinking about it. Well, just... you don't look at the mantelpiece when you're stoking the fire, do you, Stu? What are you saying? What I'm saying is you don't look at an ant's head when you're having sex you with it, do you? Come on, you are sick. I'm not you are I'd sick. ask you this question. Who is the real sick man in this so called <laughs> society? Is it the man who lays a trail of sugar out to try and lure Natalie and Bruglia with the head of an ant? Yeah. And the mind and personality and instincts of an ant. Exactly, yeah. Stu, yeah. Lure into his house to try and pleasure himself with her in whatever way he desires. Yeah, before the little oxygen supply runs out. Yeah, maybe, possibly, or maybe not. You know, as long as she's still warm, that's oh, the important you're sick. thing. You're sick. Or, or sick. is it the businessman in his suit and tie having sex with the same woman his wife. 
Every day of his life for 40 years. Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, it's the first one. It's the ant, you know, head, lure, sugar... No, shit. wait, mate, I made a mistake. No, wait, I made a mistake. Who's the real sick man? Is it the ant, Natalie and Brugler, lure, yeah. sugar man? Or is it the bloke who dresses up as Big Daddy and tries to get children to bounce on his stomach? Okay. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. They're both you, aren't they? It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> didn't think it well, through. Think it well, through I didn't think it through. Well, I didn't think it through. I did not think it through. I want 500 words on why Ben Elton is more sexist than Benny Hill, and I want it now! The best thing about oh, being the editor of Britain's riest, most ironic magazine is being able to keep Britain's riest and most ironic journalists on their toes. Oh, before I start, I should just say that Ned, darling Ned Shering, has asked me to send one of you along to be on weekends this Saturday. Yeah, I fancy a crack at that, telling the toffs where to stick it. No. No. So, no. do bear in mind that I am looking for someone? I mean, I don't even want to be on weekends or whatever it's called. You know, I think if Sasha chose me, I'd actually physically be sick. You know, having said that, you know, if you told her I said that, she'd probably choose me just to spite me. So don't go telling her, all right? No. All right. You know, it's just, I know you documentary guys, right? Probably go out to the office and tell her now just to get some good footage. No, we won't. No, right. Good. So, um, so you're not going to tell her, right? Great. Let's chop this one out on a mirror and see who sniffs it up. The Mr. Men. Oh, yeah, Mr. Men, I love them. They're great. It's been done already, Tony. Mr. Men has been done already by Roger Hargreaves. I know they were good, though, weren't they, Simon? Not I like the just the Mr. Best. Men. Mr. The politically correct Mr. Men. Ah. What was he called? Mr. Summer. He had a little hat on. So, blue hat. Instead of Mr. Small, we have Mr. Vertically Challenged. Ah. Oh. Mr. Squiggle or something. Instead of Mr. Had fat, we have Mr. Size Challenged. Ah. Mr. Oh, Wiggle. Okay. And instead of Mr. Homosexual, we have Mr. Heterosexually Challenged. Ah. Right? Oh. We've got oh. Mr. Heterosexually Challenged. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've already called uh, Kipper up to do the drawings on that one. It's a stupid idea. Mr. Wiggly Worm or something? No, it's, there isn't a Mr. Fat, is there? Or a Mr. Homosexual. Doing satires of political correctness is a hackneyed ten-year-old idea. For that kind of bare-faced cheek, I should either sack you on the spot or promote you to deputy editor. But I'm not going to do either. Ah, wow. you didn't expect that. I expected it. You didn't. Actually. What I am going to do is suggest that you go along to represent us on weekends on Saturday. All right. Mr. Tickle, that was him with his arms. He used to tickle people. That's how he got his name. Oh. <laughs> you know, it was only a bit of radio. <laughs> I've always said radio is where you begin and end your career. <laughs> I, actually, I hate radio. I hate everyone who's on it, including myself. Yeah. Oh, I can see from your face you didn't expect me to say that, but I did. I think it's true as well. Hello and welcome to Weekends. I'm Ned Shering, the meat I on the bird. I can't believe it's Simon's on. I can't believe it's all I know on the radio. Who is perhaps better known as the Stoat, erstwhile columnist of the Ironic Review. What have you got for us this, this week, I wonder? Well, Ned, I've got a story about the Mr. Men. The politically <laughs> correct Mr. Man. <laughs> so, uh, instead of Mr. Small, I've come up with Mr. Vertically Challenged. Uh, and he's a single parent lesbian. Uh, he lives not with Mr. Grumpy, like you'd expect. No, Mr. Sad. Mr. Seasonally Affected. Tony? That's a band now. I love you. You love me. Yeah, you love me. What's going on? I love that. you. Kiss me. That. Get off me. Hey, I get you with my flick knife. Okay, right, stop. <laughs> Just get out now. Go. But this is go, so go. boring. Nicola, don't do that. But when it finish, huh? Very soon. Now get out. Go and sit down somewhere. Honestly. You're a disgrace. Anyway, will you please welcome the Curious Orange? <laughs> Hello, 
Mr. Stu. Hello, Mr. Rich. I am Curious Orange. Great. And what are you curious about this week, I wonder? Well, this week, Mr. Rich, I'm a bit curious about this conundrum. <laughs> why do men have nipples? I mean, what's that all about? I'm very curious to know why that should be. You know, well, yeah, I think I can answer <laughs> this one for you, you see. Think, uh, it's all due yeah. to the uh, development of the fetus in the womb. I mean, I mean, men can't lactate, can they? <laughs> so why do they have no, nipples? No, well, if you listen, listen, I'm trying to explain right, to you why yeah, the reason is, right. OK? So every, every human being is based on a little template that grows in the womb, and it's yeah. only about week 13 that that fetus starts to grow, so... You know, yeah, but, but why do men have nipples? I mean, they're just useless, aren't they? Look, are you, are you, are you really curious about this? <laughs> You're not listening, are you? You know, are, you know, are you curious or not? Yes, I'm curious, Orange. Well, listen to the answer then. You know, Rich has asked the question. You just smirk through it. Yeah. You don't seem to be listening at all. Listen to the answer. Ooh, keep your hair on. Just strikes me strange that men have nipples. I just thought it was funny. Well, it doesn't matter if it's funny, does it? You know, are you are you the curious Orange or are you the bad observational comedy Orange? What? <laughs> I'm curious, Orange. Right. Just listen, listen to the answer then, OK? So it's basically, it's all to do with this template from which either a male or female child can grow. And so that takes 13 weeks before the, before the thing <laughs> gets decided. Will you stop doing that and just listen, right? And then that's why men have nipples, because nipples, nipples exist on the template. That I'm, stay, don't do that. No, that's the answer, because it's on the template. Is your, is your curiosity satisfied now, Curious Orange? Yeah. Well, is it or not? Yes! Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Stu, Mr. Rich. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, the Curious Orange. It's so rude, it's so rude, it's really strange. It's, you know, it's, it's gone to his head, hasn't yeah, it? What, what do you mean by his head? I don't know. What, yeah. that there? Yeah. All of him, I think. Mm. Don't really know. The non-believer said, I do not believe God exists because I have not seen him. The wise man replied, and do you believe that oxygen exists? Yes, he said, not noticing the trap I had set for him. <laughs> and yet, I concluded, you have not seen oxygen, have you? No, he said, but scientists have through very strong microscopes or something. Oh, my poor fool, I responded, that is different. And although he tried to pretend otherwise, the moat fell from his eyes, and he believed. <laughs> We're back over here with uh, King Jason. There he is. He's being fed by the two lovely slaves there. That's very good. Are you enjoying being king? Yes, great. Yeah. Yeah. Sweets this week. It's not Sweets, bad. Sweets, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, yeah. you, uh, the royal family have been having your uh, privileges stripped, haven't you? People are not curtsying to you anymore. Do you think they all should curtsy? I think so, yes, really. Could, could you two curtsy? curtsy Come on, curtsy. curtsy. This is, this is yeah. our royal family. Keep curtsying. Well, curtsy, yeah, Trevor. Work with a bit of effort. Come on, do it properly. That's very good. So, uh, what, what do you think about the, the royal family? Do you think they should keep their HRH thing? Do you think uh, Princess Michael of Kent should be HRH? Yeah, I think the ones that are left are quite good, yeah. I yeah. think you should have a royal title because you drew quite a good picture. Yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jason, Jason King. Jason King, that would work well, wouldn't it? Yeah. Has anyone made that connection before? <laughs> no. Oh, this is so boring. I hate them. They let him. Which we got. Stop that. Do that. They do not work hard on that. Get that. Stop that. Stop That's only for emergency. Stop it. Stop it. Don't do that. Don't turn it on. Don't turn it on. Don't turn it on. Get him off. Get off now. I am Roger Crowley, the wickedest man in the world. Wicked is as wicked does. On Tuesday, I threw doped bread into my garden and watched as the birds that ate it fell to the ground. Let the mayhem commence. As the birds slept, I tied bits of string from their feet to my hands. Soon the birds would wake and carry me aloft over my neighbor's garden thus. Mr. and Mrs. Rampton at number 19 would have no option but to worship me as a god. Unfortunately, when the birds woke, instead of rising as one, they became enraged and pecked at my face and eye. My avian scheme had failed. But imagine if it had not. What wickedness there would have been! Oh yes, one day you will all see my power. Oh, 
He's on it! He's back! He's giving me a Chinese burn oh, shoe! Go, oh, go, go to the next. Go to the next item. Men of Achievement. Nice and tall. And she's back to say it! You made the smell of... Men of Achievement 1974. This week's Man of Achievement 1974 is Robin Nelson Dudding. Robin is an editor from Hastings in New Zealand and is married to Lois Yvonne Miller. They have one son and five daughters. If you are interested in knowing more about Robin Nelson Dudding, he is also listed in Who's Who in New Zealand. Men of Achievement. 1974. Look at that. Awful. That's the French. Oh, that's the French for you, Men Fantastic. of Achievement 1974 there, proving to be perhaps the least popular regular strand of the show. <laughs> Not entertaining and of minimal educational value. But we will be carrying on doing it, whatever <laughs> happens. Until it gets its own series. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, new millennium. Look, you stop about the millennium. I it's said, important. I, like I it. want to go on about the millennium. It's very important. It's a very important time because a lot of people think the new millennium is the time that the new Jesus will arrive. What do you mean by the new Jesus? What what do you he's mean like the new schmoo, right. but uh, he's more, more Jesus-y and right. he does magic tricks instead oh, yeah, of going... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, I see, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, in fact, a lot of people are actually saying about Jesus that he's already here, kind of looking around wisely. He, Maybe what? he's sitting here Covered on this sofa foam. now. What are, you say what are you saying You have to suffer, Stu. I'm what not saying that I'm Jesus, Stu. That is for other people to say. Rich, one you can't <laughs> keep suggesting you're God's representative on earth. Stu, God is my father, who Art Garfunkel believes in as well, There's so no he must be real. Through, you are I'm not, you are I, not, you don't, look, uh, you don't look anything like Jesus, uh, do you? My poor fool, my poor don't lamb. Uh, it. It's not do you an not R see? Uh, not an R, what? Uh, for it is written, Stu, they will not recognise him when he comes. You didn't recognise me, so I must be Jesus. Yeah, I did recognise you. Quid pro quo. I, I, it I works did, out. No. Remember this morning when someone with a high voice Spanish accent tried to ring you up and sell you an orthopaedic bed? Remember? Yeah. Hello, Mr. Lee. Do you want to buy an orthopaedic bed? I am Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> that was you. Yeah. But you did not recognise me when I called you. Yeah, I didn't recognise you because you had a high voice no. doing a Spanish accent. You didn't recognise me because I'm Jesus. It doesn't That's work. why. Like that. <laughs> Do you remember about a week ago you were sitting on the tube? And a man dressed as Darth Vader sat down opposite you yeah. going... <laughs> that was me, that was Stu. You. Yeah, but you didn't recognise me. you were dressed as Darth Vader. It's not, it's because I'm Jesus. Oh, That's why you didn't recognise me. Do you remember about a month ago, you yeah. were walking through Finsbury Park, yeah. and a man leapt out of the bushes wearing nothing but a hockey mask in a state of priapic excitement, yeah, Stu. Yeah. <laughs> leapt out with, whoa, like that. Do you remember? Yeah. That was me, but you did not recognise me when I came. Um, I did recognise you when you came, Rich, but uh, I thought it was best not to draw attention to the fact because I felt the resulting publicity would harm both our careers. <laughs> well, they sometimes recognise Jesus, so it's, I am still you Jesus. I am. No. I'm Jesus. No. I am. Muslims, you are wrong and I am right. So come on. Join our lot. <laughs> hey! Uh, we're going to have a quick look at the, uh, the week's papers. I saw the day that um, Paul Simon's uh, musical closed in uh, New York. You must be annoyed about it. He's one of your heroes. No, I'm, I hate him now, Stu. I'm glad. I'm glad. He's an evil, disgusting man. Why? He has unnatural desires what towards animals. He's unnatural. Towards animals? He does. What He's unnatural. disgusting. Everyone knows it, Stu. He what? What sang mean? about it in his song, in the boxer, he said. Asking only workman's wages, I came looking for a job, but I got no offers, just to come on from the horse on 7th Avenue. Say <laughs> the horse. And then he says, he declares it. I say, I do declare there were times I was so lonesome I took some comfort there. You've misheard he's sick. It. How did he do that? He's, he's a not, sick man, he's honestly. Not, he's, he's like Catherine the Great. He's he not is. like he's Catherine the Great, which is, you've, yes. missed, you've missed her again. Yes. Another Awful nearly work. a minute out of mishearing a simple song there. They found, good, you see that they found water on the, on the moon? That yeah, they story. did, yeah. yeah. And uh, that means we can go further into space, right? right. And uh, Rick Tomlinson of the Space Frontier Foundation said, this shows the moon is a stepping stone. Um, if God had wanted us to go into space, he or she would have given us a moon, and mm. they did. Yeah. Well, God obviously didn't want us to go into space that much, didn't he? Right. He'd, have, he'd have made the water a bit easier to find. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, if he'd really wanted us to go into space, he could have just made us emerge from the moon with kind of fuel canisters attached to our heads, powerful enough to shoot our infant bodies out beyond the ozone layer. Oh, if he really, really wanted us to go into space, right? He could have just made us born in outer space, couldn't he? Yeah. In space, in there, that would have worked. Do you like the, uh, the organ gang, Ben? 
No, it's boring. Ben, who's this Ben character? From Planet Mer. All oh, right. <laughs> it's time to meet the organ gang again. <laughs> Welcome back. Lily Liver still isn't eating, and our organy chums don't know what to do about it. Well, said Barry, I remember seeing an episode of Mr. Ben once that wasn't dissimilar to this scenario. Uh, no, this is different to that. No, it isn't. Even the trumpet music was the same. Anyway, the way Mr. Ben made the spoilt princess eat was to invite all the urchins from the neighbourhood to come and join in the feast. I'm just after the toilet. <laughs> the only things resembling urchins in Organland were the kidney kids, Kim and Kenny Kidney. I don't want to eat with these stinking little brats. I am sophisticated. I like eating expensive fruit and can apes with interesting rich people, not crisps and jelly with small urine processing organs. <laughs> well, there's no need to be rude. Perhaps I can be of some assistance. It's Henry's uncle, Suspensa Spleen, the richest, most sophisticated organ in the world. I think I know what might help you get back your appetite, Lily. A night out with me at the Wrist Hotel. Oh, yes. Oh, Spencer, come on. Let's go. I'm starving. Well, it looks like thanks to me and my poshness, Lily Liver has spleen the error of her ways. <laughs> and everyone laughed till bedtime at this brilliant wordplay. <laughs> Except Henry was a bit sad that, after all his efforts to impress Lily, he had been cuckolded by a spleen in a top hat. <laughs> so, did the Wrist Hotel live up to your expectations, Lily? But it was nice of Henry to go to all that trouble to make you all that food. So, I suppose what we've learned is that, given the choice, girls will choose blokes with money every time and are more likely to get them if they are dangerously thin. <laughs> Goodbye, Lily. Hooray <laughs> <laughs> for the organ gag there. That is the end of the show, just time for the results of our phone poll. And here are the results. 25% said they wanted to see Lee Hurst's head on a llama. 31% wanted to see Pat Sharp's head grafted on a lizard with a fly's eye. And the winner, 44%, wanted to see an ant's head on the body of Natalie Imbruglia. So let's just enjoy that startling image once again. Mm. No. I, find that, I find that slightly arousing just thinking about it. Right, uh, why not send us your own image of a genetically modified celebrity? That's right, it could be a collage or a drawing that you have done in crayon or pen. Yeah, even if you're grown up, do it. Send them to this address, to Mwunringer, no. room 3306, <laughs> Tiverser, London, Wood 12, 7 Ridge. By Thursday, please. And the best one will be the king of the show here in London, in London Town, next week. I'm going to just say about that, don't email uh, pictures to us, because our computer isn't actually good enough to translate them, so don't do that. Send them through the post. Yeah, um, you can uh, email us, though, if you want to ask us about anything, or uh, visit our website on that address there that should be up now. Anyway, stand up, put on your Church of England hats, and let's close with this week's hymn. Oh, Jesus, I have mm. promised. Oh, no, why go. do we have to sing a hymn? Hymns are boring. Let's well, sing Europa. We always do it. We always do it. We we always do it. Do it. Oh, I hate England. It's so bumming crap. Okay, all right. Europa. Right. Do what yeah. you want. If it'll make you happy. Maybe. Okay. We sing the greatest hit of all Europe. Opus's big song, Life is Life. You know it? Life is life. La, 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 la. Life is life. La, 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 la. Life is life. La, 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 la. La 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 When we all get the power We all get the best Every minute of an hour Don't think about the rest When we all get the power We all get the best Every minute of an hour Don't think about the rest Life is life I made it I liked it You didn't like it Their clothes and then sending them off on a full Monty-style tour of Northern Working Men's Clubs. <laughs> Boring! Aim three is to replace Saddam Hussein's moustache with a slug that has been trained to burrow into his face while he's asleep <laughs> and eat the parts of his brain that make him evil. <laughs> Aim four is to have the KFC nibbling it girls, Tara Palmer Tompkinson and Tamara Beckwith, deep fried in hot oil, battered in Colonel Sanders' secret recipe and then fed to a pack of ravenous dogs. 
Finger licking good, apparently so. Yeah. And aim five, finally, to capture a Bigfoot live and then force it to live with a cutesy American family to see if it would really have lovable sitcom style adventures or whether it would just rip off the children's heads and drink their blood. <laughs> oh, boring! That's, that's, that's all the aims for this week. Judge us on our ability to fulfil them. Don't because... do that. It's it's so Stop it! So unprofessional. I'm sorry, you? those are illegal. <laughs> Let us eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> Over to Joe Unwin and the actor Kevin Eldon for this week's phone. And the BBC lawyers have told us that we are legally obliged to read out this letter that we received last week. Dear BBC, I am writing to protest in the strongest possible terms about the sketch last week in which I, Anthony Hopkins, a respected Oscar-winning actor, was implied to be harbouring repressed sexual desires for my co-starring actresses, desires which eventually vented themselves in a most disturbing and perverted way. I deny this completely, and as my good name has been sullied, unless an immediate apology is forthcoming, I shall be forced to seek legal advice. Yours sincerely, Anthony Hopkins. P.S. I am winking as I write. <laughs> It's winking, Stuart. Anthony Hopkins is winking hey. as he writes that. Man, it's got a sense of fun behind it. Certainly has. Um, will you please welcome on the keyboards Richard Thomas. <laughs> Musician and actor Richard is 33 years old and lives in rented accommodation near London's fashionable Elephant and Castle. Oh, lay off, Stuart. Well, you do. <laughs> on the listings couch, husband and wife information team Joe Unwin and the actor Kevin Eldon. <laughs> And don't go forgetting our gorgeous new bar slaves, Trevor and Natalie. Trevor and Natalie. Yay! Easy on the eye. They're easy on the eye, here so they come. It's easy on. on the eye. Now, if you've been watching uh, in previous weeks, you'll know that like the Parliamentary oh, Labour Party... Shut up, Nicholas. Excuse me, mate, I'm trying to talk well, here. Excuse me, mate, I'm trying to talk here. I'm Stuart. Richard, who is this? It's, it's Nicolas, it's my French exchange partner. Well, what is he doing here? <laughs> it's his turn to come over to Britain. Well, you're still doing exchanges now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't really opinion. like him very much. You know, yeah. he, he smells a bit unusual and, uh, you know, he bullies me all the time. But, you know, he's, my mum says Richard, he has to come you're on. You're 30 years old, uh, you have to do exchanges, do you? Come on, Rich, let's go. We said we'd go to the truck at Hero, yeah? Go on rock circus and sing a well. Come on. No, look, we just have to do this. It's 45 minutes, okay? Just sit nicely so and wait. Boring. Just, just, no. just keep them quiet, all right? Yeah, just keep them quiet. Don't mock me like that. <laughs> Shut up, Nicola. Just gotta do this. Just Shut stop up. it. Right now, like the Parliamentary Labour Party. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> we have five aims which we hope to fulfil by the end of the series. Yeah, let's recap and see how we're getting on so far. Aim one is to prove that the mystery father of Jodie Foster's baby is in fact Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> and that she is the only one of his co-stars to have succumbed to his depraved advances. Boy. Apart from the grizzly bear in the edge. And uh, <laughs> aim two is to attempt to make the royal family more popular by stripping them not only of their titles, but also of... Hello, I'm Richard. And I'm not Judy. And this is the show that everyone's calling... To Ranger. Well, they're not. They are, they just they're did. Not... <laughs> <laughs> And I'm called Richard Herring, and welcome to the show that absolutely everyone is calling to Wumranger. Yeah, well, they're not, are they? They are, they're they not, just did it, Stu. You, you heard made them do it. I um, didn't, they said be, it was before, spontaneous. Before we start, we had a, a rather serious complaint oh, yeah. uh, about last week's show from the Broadcasting Standards Commission. In. Oh, boring! Hey, 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 hey. 
stinking frog. Now, this, <laughs> this week's phone-in explores the possibilities of cloning and gen genetic engineering and asks you to decide, is humanity really responsible enough to play God? Yes. What kind of choices would you make if the genes of famous people and various animals were left in your hands? So, dial 0891-338801 if you would genetically engineer a hybrid of They Think It's All Over contestant Lee Hurst and a llama. 0891-338801. Dial 0891-338802 if you'd create a monstrous union of Challenge TV's Pat Sharp, <laughs> a lizard's body and the eye of a fly. 0891-338802. And dial 0891-338803 if you'd fashion a mutant out of the body of Natalie Imbruglia and the head of an ant. 0891-338803. In the name of reason, dial now. And we should point out there that in all those instances, neither the animal parts nor the human body parts have been proportionally increased or decreased in size to match each other. Thus, you'll have seen there, Pat Sharp's head, for example, uh, would be far too big for his body, his lizard.